chapter twelve of the ghost girl by henry kitchell webster this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve through the grill a confession i cried something to do with this murder where did you get it who did you get it from i'll tell you all about it said geoffrey i'd like to see what you think because i never was more puzzled in my life he smoked half the cigarette before he said anything more i sat still and waited i knew what he had to tell me would be worth waiting for but if you and richards think he began again that i've been lying on flowery beds of ease spinning theories you're very much mistaken i've been doing the grimiest kind of detective work including an attempted burglary i've been scared at a conservative estimate out of three years growth i've followed false leads oh richards would sympathize with me if he knew the whole story why didn't you tell him i asked i'm not ready yet said geoffrey you'll see plainly enough when i get through you said you followed a false lead said i were you looking up the woman too the barton woman no said geoffrey i had to have some colour of probability about what i was looking for that barton woman's confession wouldn't have deceived a child no i started in on the jap the man who played the organ at the seance geoffrey nodded it cost me four solid days he said and got me nowhere oh it was interesting enough in itself and it did throw an interesting sidelight or two on irene fournier's character but it doesn't unlock our mystery that fellow's at the head of a regular secret service a sort of blackmail syndicate he's as much feared in certain quarters as any man in new york i got a hint from richards himself when i realized what an unhealthy lot togo knew about my affairs everybody treats japanese servants like that we know so little about their concerns that it never occurs to us that they're taking an interest in ours but the japanese is a born spy it's perhaps the most conspicuous talent he possesses this fellow had genius enough to organize it there are thousands of japanese servants in this country and apparently a good proportion of them report to this chap the spiritualists and divorce while you wait lawyers would be nowhere without him but he seems to have met his match in irene she used him to hook miss meredith and to get my portrait and she must have had some hold on him or she wouldn't have dared play fast and loose with him the way she did evidently she gave him the slip completely he stayed on with mrs barton apparently in the hope of picking up the trail there again even after he discovered that irene was murdered he evidently hoped to pick up something big in a blackmailing way i doubt if he thought barton did it or the game wouldn't have seemed worth the candle but it is equally evident that he thought barton knew some things that would interest him there i am inclined to agree with him we may run across him again or we may not my guess is that he pulled out of the affair altogether when he found us in it he took up four perfectly good days of my time anyway geoffrey fell into another long thoughtful silence and finally i prompted him well said i what did you do next the next thing i did said geoffrey was to get that frame back from the decorator who stole it and pay the poor devil a hundred dollars under the law i believe that's compounding a felony but it's making a friend anyway and that's more important i mounted the portrait in the frame had it boxed up wrote crow a note telling him that i was sending it to miss meredith's town address and that i would call the next day that's yesterday i said in the note that i was very anxious to see miss meredith as i thought i had some things to tell her that would interest her i told him that i understood that he hadn't felt it wise heretofore that an interview should take place between miss meredith and myself but that i thought there were important reasons why he should reverse his decision i made it as clear as i know how that i meant business just the thing i should think to put him on his guard 
said i if he's got any subterranean reason for avoiding such an interview exactly said geoffrey with a nod i meant to put him on his guard i got a polite note from him by a special messenger late that same afternoon saying that miss meredith would be glad to see me when i got that i put a suit of pyjamas in a bag and caught the night boat up the river you what i exclaimed of course he said if i really meant to see her i shouldn't have written any note i'd have taken the portrait in a taxi and gone to the house without any warning i felt pretty sure that when he knew i was coming he'd send miss meredith out for a drive or convince her that she wasn't strong enough to leave her bed receive me himself when i called and entertain me with a polite excuse that i couldn't probably quarrel with by that means he'd get the portrait which undoubtedly he wants and at the same time deprive me of any excuse for repeating my visit then you didn't want to see miss meredith said i why yes i've wanted to see her for some time but there was something just then i wanted more drew do you believe in the atmospheres that hang about places i don't know that i believe in them myself but i feel it i wanted to see the country house where miss meredith lived the place where i understand she stayed all last summer and late into the fall do you know where it is she lives i don't believe i do said i geoffrey looked at me fixedly she lives he said at a place called beech hill it's ten or twelve miles from silver springs up the river from silver springs there's something familiar about that name said i but i don't place it silver springs he said is where that ice cutter found the body of well we'll go on calling her irene fournier for a while yet just to be on the safe side geoffrey i gasped you don't mean that irene fournier is only another name for for claire meredith no i don't mean that yet i mean exactly what i say that for the present we'll go on calling her irene fournier and beech hill miss meredith's country place is that near the river geoffrey nodded about ten miles up as i said the suggestion fairly made my head spin i cast my mind back in an endeavour to fit the facts we had about her about the mysterious vision geoffrey had had in paris with this new theory of his he saw what i was doing and interrupted me don't stop to think yet he said listen that old house beech hill has been drawing me like a magnet i didn't know exactly what i expected to find there but i knew as well as i knew anything that if i could prowl around there by myself if i could get into that old house on any pretext or no pretext at all and see the background to the picture that some of the things that must have happened in the foreground of it would begin to soak through richards would laugh at that wouldn't he but i tell you drew it's gospel truth but why in the world if that was what you wanted did you make the appointment with miss meredith geoffrey gave his head the little shake i was so familiar with it does seem rather a fool thing to have done because i suppose i might have anticipated exactly what happened of course what i wanted is plain enough i wanted to give crow something to amuse himself with i wanted to make sure that he'd be in town that day on the job i had an idea that he'd been showing a certain amount of interest in my movements lately i didn't want him opening the front door when i rang the bell at beech hill prepared to tell him that i was a house agent or something of that sort and i thought my note the surest way of nailing him down in new york you don't mean to tell me i exclaimed that he outguessed you figured out what you meant to do and got to beech hill ahead of you no he didn't do that he did a perfectly obvious thing a thing so obvious that i never thought of it but wait let me tell you the story in order 
my first plan was to take the evening train up to oldborough spend the night there and drive out to beech hill in the morning but at the last minute i changed my plan i saw by the papers that they'd just started running the night boats up there and that offered several advantages it cut out both the railroad station and the hotel two good places to avoid if you're also trying to avoid observation and then the fog on the river these first mild days is good to look at i generally sleep pretty well on anything that's moving so i counted as another advantage a good night's sleep he laughed ruefully didn't you get it i asked i got said he what i really think was the most horrible abominable night i ever had in my life i tried to go to bed early to begin with and that's always a mistake got into my bunk turned out the light and began waiting for sleep about two hours before its scheduled time to arrive there couldn't have been many passengers but with the typical intelligence of his class the purser put me in a stateroom next to one that was occupied there was nothing but a thin wooden partition between going up to within six inches of the ceiling and that space was left open and grilled for purposes of ventilation though what is gained by ventilating one stateroom into another i never could see i noticed before i turned off my light that one piece of the wire grill was broken and had been taken out i had a notion to ask for another room but i hate to act like a fidgety old woman when i travel so i made the best of it and went to bed the adjoining stateroom was dark at that time the occupants of it having evidently come aboard early and gone to bed because i heard a murmur of voices even then two women's voices nothing they really said came through for they'd evidently noticed my light and were talking low on purpose but the inflections of one voice were somewhat commanding and the other a little servile some lady and her maid i judged them to be or companion well the sound of their voices was rather soothing than otherwise and the throb of the boat was rather pleasant i got my muscles relaxed and my pillows comfortable and was i thought on the point of pitching off to sleep when i heard a thin little tittering laugh it came from the next stateroom drew there was something horrible about it you may think that's imagination or nerves post-impressionism developed from something that happened afterwards but i tell you it wasn't the sound of that laugh made my blood run cold it wasn't loud nor prolonged nothing like the bursts of maniacal laughter that jane eyre used to hear but somehow it didn't belong with those quiet well-bred voices i heard it was as disconnected as if it had been a phonograph record i sat up in my bunk with the sweat standing out all over me there was a rustle in the next room that sounded as if someone was getting out of the upper berth and then the quiet voices went on again well i lay down swore at myself and told myself to go to sleep but it wasn't two minutes before the laugh came again it wasn't any louder this time but it lasted longer and the repetition didn't make it any the less horrible i heard one of the voices after that but the other didn't speak one of the two natural voices i mean pretty soon though another voice spoke the same voice that had laughed spoke through a horrible sort of giggle what it said was dead she's dead and then it laughed again the one natural voice that was left began talking in a soothing sort of way but the laughing voice went on paying no more attention than well that's the only simile i can think of a phonograph it had something of that quality too that horrible lifeless squeak the light went up in the other stateroom then of course it shone perfectly plain through the open space at the top of the partition and that relieved the situation a little it seemed to make it possible for me to stay there i confess i had been on the point of bolting when it was turned up i heard the clink of a spoon against glass too and that suggestion that someone was getting a dose of medicine had a quieting effect on my nerves too although the medicine itself didn't affect the patient immediately 
the phonograph voice went on for quite a little while just saying over and over again dead she's dead and giggling but presently its tone got more querulous the giggle stopped i guess i ought to know she's dead it said i killed her myself killed her with a pin then it got a note of terror in it and made a dry choking little cry i killed her i tell you i i i it kept rising higher and higher almost to a shriek and then suddenly it stopped in a muffled gasp as if the nurse if the sane person present in there was a nurse had clapped something over its mouth perhaps a pillow i suppose the medicine took effect then because that muffled gasp was the last sound i heard but by that time i wanted some of the dope myself pretty badly a maniac is not a pleasant person to encounter at the best but somehow not seeing anything just hearing through that little wooden partition made it all the worse i was a fool not to get up and dress and go on deck but i've got a spunky sort of streak in me that hates to admit that i'm beaten and i made up my mind to put myself to sleep by main brute strength of will i lay still and kept my eyes shut and tried to keep my muscles relaxed i suppose it was two hours before anything more happened though it seemed six the next thing that happened was this geoffrey got out of his chair and shook himself with a little laugh oh it would have been funny if my nerves weren't so near the breaking point i suppose it is funny still but i was lying there perfectly still hadn't heard a sound and all at once something like a tiny hand oh smaller than a baby's no bigger than a doll's but very cautious and skilful took hold of one of my eyelids and tried to lift it i don't mind admitting i yelled i was out of bed and had the light on in about the sixteenth of a second and of course for five seconds after that i couldn't see anything because the light blinded me gradually i got my eyes in focus and there squatting on a corner of my bunk right beside the pillow oh it was nothing horrible it was a baby raccoon brown and fluffy with its long pointed nose and its bright shiny little eyes pointed straight at me for a minute or two i couldn't get my bearings couldn't understand how the thing could have got in the grating over the window was intact and then i thought of the broken grill opening into the next state-room i looked around and saw the light had gone up in that room too they had probably been aroused by my yell well it would have aroused anything but the dead i felt foolish and that made me feel furious i moved over toward the little beast somewhat too suddenly and it scuttered away jumped up on the washstand and from there on top of the mirror and disappeared through the broken grill all in about a second i waited for a scream from there because of course i couldn't be sure the little beast was at home there but evidently it was for they took his coming quietly enough well i didn't turn out the light after that but i got back into bed and pulled up all the blankets because i was cold all through i had never been so terrified in my life the possibility of going to sleep after that never occurred to me but presently the grey of the dawn began to come in and that is the signal for insomniacs the world over the first thing i knew the steward was rapping on my door telling me it was seven o'clock when i had got up and dressed and before i left the boat i took a look into the next stateroom but it was perfectly empty the bed all made as if no one had been in there for a week i felt like the devil after the night i had had and had half a mind to give up my trip and take the next train back to new york but i thought better of it hired a team of horses in surrey and drove out to beech hill End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the ghost girl by henry kitchell webster this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Beech Hill I saw by my driver's look when I told him where I wanted to go 
that he knew about the place and after i had sized him up with a little casual talk i blessed my stars that i had been able to get him he was a simon pure native of those parts and what he didn't know about local gossip wouldn't be worth listening to the merediths must have furnished a good part of that gossip themselves for certainly they had been a queer eccentric family for several generations a self-willed imperious high-tempered lot at the best with a little streak of insanity or near it cropping up now and then that made the worst of them very bad indeed it's good blood though as such things are reckoned in most countries they have always bred to their class but the only other member of the family in the direct line and in miss meredith's generation a younger brother of hers was an exception to the rule it seems he was artistic in his tendencies and showed a good deal of talent as a painter in an amateurish sort of way lived abroad a lot mostly in france and scandalized his family by marrying a normandy peasant girl that's the instinct of the overbred everywhere nature's way of reasserting herself this woman claire's mother must have been a perfectly glorious creature to look at certainly claire came honestly by those great masses of pale gold hair that people went so mad about i wish you could have heard my driver's attempt to describe her the upstate native isn't naturally rhapsodic and his attempts were really amusing well it seems meredith brought his wife home and the other members of the family were properly superior and indignant especially his sister and the poor young wife just withered up under it meredith himself doesn't appear to have been a very strong sort of character certainly his sister was all the man of the family she had all the business sense and as she shared equally with him in the family fortune to begin with she actually managed according to the driver's gossip to get hold of the lion's share of it meredith was killed racing an ice yacht on the river when claire was six or seven and his wife didn't survive him very long so his sister came back to beach hill and took charge of the estate and of claire she must have brought the child up under an iron rule and that sort of thing generally works badly in the end then as crow admitted to you she terrorized the rest of the family there are no end of rather distant cousins you know crow among them got fearfully bored with life and at last closed up beech hill and her town house and went off to europe that as i remember it was when claire was about fifteen miss meredith never came back to this country even for an occasional visit until about three years ago she came back alone of course and the story was that claire had died of smallpox in paris since she came back she has been dividing her time between her town house and beech hill though she hasn't done it in the ordinary way she spent a good many winter months up there all alone with crow for nobody has ever been invited to the place since she came back and of course her odd way of living has set all the gossip afire again i got all of that practically all of it out of the driver as a matter of fact i had to pump him about something to keep him from pumping me the story i told him was that i had been told by a new york real estate agent that the place might be for sale and i wanted to look at it i told him that in order to find out if possible if there was any intention of selling it and found out what isn't at all surprising under the circumstances that there was at least he had driven one or two other prospective purchasers out there so that made my plan rather easy when we got to the boundaries of the estate i paid his fare and sent him back telling him that i wanted to wander about outdoors a bit before i went to the house and that i'd trust to luck for means of getting back i wanted to make sure of seeing something anyway and as it turned out 
it was well i did before i had been wandering around the place for half an hour my desire to buy it was genuine even if my intention wasn't drew it's perfectly lovely fields lawns woods the lie of the land the glimpses you get every now and then of the river and of the distant banks it's hard to beat i tell you it was all so lovely in its first hint of spring way it almost made me forget the grim sort of errand i had come on i skirted around through the woods got myself mired and mould stained to the knees and finally started down toward the river bank along a little path i found the path was muddy and wet for the snow couldn't have melted off earlier than the day before yet i could see that it must be lovely a little later when the green things came out but drew i hadn't more than started down that path before i began thinking about the murder again and i got a sort of hint of the reason when i saw where the path was taking me it led down to a white painted boathouse on the bank the sight of that made the sensation come back twice as strong if i was right in connecting beech hill with the tragedy if irene fournier had gone once by a different name altogether and i had made the right guess as to what that name was then the chances were that it was along this path that the body had been carried and it was here at this little landing that it had been put into the river i could even go further than that the winter had set in suddenly very soon after the body had been put into the water the spring had only just come it wasn't unreasonable to suppose that the last person before myself to come down that path and step out on the little boat landing had been the person who carried the body in his arms geoffrey i cried wasn't there some clue some real clue he shook his head with a grim laugh something that richards would have called a clue do you mean a wisp of blonde hair caught in a splinter on the gunwale of a boat or a blood-stained handkerchief or a rag of white satin caught on a thorn bush beside the path no there was nothing like that i don't see any reason why there shouldn't have been said i there isn't any he admitted and i confess i looked for something like that but this is all i did see the boathouse is a substantially built affair on concrete piles the windows on both sides were fitted with solid shutters and the sliding door with a good lock to make it really difficult for a marauder to get in it needed to be for it contained a high-power motor-boat that might very well be stolen or borrowed for a joy-ride the house is built around a slip so that the boat could come into it under its own power when i saw it it was hoisted out of the water on slings for the winter how did you get in if it was as well locked up as that i said it had a lock not that it was locked as a matter of fact the sliding door was only partly shut it had got off its rollers as sliding doors will and the last person to try to shut it hadn't bothered to fix it it gaped open about eight inches it had been like that all winter too judging by the drift of half-melted snow and ice that had got inside i squeezed inside and looked around the person who had laid up the launch for the winter wasn't the one who had left in such a hurry judging by the ship-shape way he had done his job but there was another boat in there that had evidently been out since it was a small river skiff and it lay listed over on the floor of the boathouse just far enough in to clear the door though there was a pair of slings for it too the person who had dragged it in hadn't even bothered to unship the oars a thing that almost any boatman would have done from force of habit the boat had been brought in by someone who was in a hurry i think even richards would be willing to admit that but was there nothing else there was this geoffrey's eyes narrowed thoughtfully there was a long painter on the boat one end of it made fast as usual to a ring in the bow the other end had been tied around the forward thwart and then cut do you see what i mean twenty-five feet of the painter was fast to the bow-ring 
five feet of the same rope was still tied around the forward thwart both ends were cut clean as if they had once belonged together he gave a sort of shiver then and stopped then seeing that whatever sinister significance lay in the fact was still not apparent to me he set his teeth and explained the boat was pretty small for that sort of freight perhaps the murderer had never meant to use a boat he brought the body down and threw it in from the landing and then he saw that the current wasn't going to carry it away it was caught in an eddy perhaps so he got out the boat and rowed over to it he must tow it out into the channel he passes the painter around it under the arms perhaps his boat drifts away from it a little before he has time to make the line fast about the body he doesn't want to handle it any more than necessary so he simply makes the other end of the painter fast to the thwart the forward thwart mind you because he's got to tow backwards and pulls away out into the channel when he gets out there he tries to untie the line but cuts it instead to save time you can guess that he'd be in a panic of haste by then and rows back to the boathouse there's the picture can you see it i can see it as you describe it to me in that convincing way of yours but do you suppose richards could see it too jeffrey smiled ruefully i shouldn't even want him to a man who could see pictures like that would be much too flighty for the force there are probably a dozen hypothetical explanations of everything i found there at the boathouse that would never cover the case as well as the picture i see but i do see this one drew plainer than i can make you understand and i believe it's true when i went up the path again bound for the big house this time i scrutinized it pretty closely i suppose sherlock holmes would have found no end of clues and by the time he'd reached the veranda of the house would have been able to tell the whole story of the crime just where everybody had gone and how fast they walked and whether they were right or left-handed and whether their shirts were custom-made or not but i didn't find anything except here and there a pair of wheel tracks they were narrow gauge no wider than a child's express wagon but the wheels themselves were broad nearly two inches i should say in some of the shady parts of the path where the ground was still frozen hard the tracks were there frozen in so i knew they must have been made before the freeze at the end of ten minutes walking the path bent around over the crest of a little ridge and gave me my first view of the house i stopped a minute and looked it over it was a rather rambling structure composed roughly of a series of l's jutting out to catch the southwest breeze on one side and to give the windows and terraces on the other a view of the river the architecture was a little too good to be true in other words it had been made into something a little more strictly colonial than anything they really built in the colonial days it looked rather desolate and austere as such a place is likely to look when it isn't occupied by enough people to keep it tolerably full it wasn't boarded up though and that was a relief because i had fully determined to break in if there were no other way of accomplishing my purpose but as long as there was a caretaker there the purpose would be vastly easier of accomplishment the path i had been following converged now into a brick-laid walk which curved about through the shrubbery and led not to the porticoed main entrance but to a smaller doorway at the head of a flight of brick steps the steps led also to a brick-paved pergola evidently meant in the summer time to have a gay striped awning stretched over it just now it was basking warmly in the march sun i went up to the door and rapped lightly with a genuine old colonial knocker which i found there instead of a bell i hadn't planned what i should say to the person who opened the door because it seemed better somehow to trust to the inspiration of the moment so much would depend on what sort of person the caretaker happened to be it was lucky i hadn't any very fixed idea no little explanatory speech committed to memory if i had such a thing on the tip of my tongue i'd have been a good deal worse disconcerted than i was the knocker was pulled out of my hand by the door being briskly opened by some one whose hand must have been on the knob when i started to knock someone in the act of coming out 
there in the passage very erect and self-possessed blinking a little in the sudden flood of sunshine that came in when the door opened stood whom do you suppose drew the last person i expected to find there miss meredith herself she's one of the most wonderful-looking old ladies i ever saw in my life beautiful what we mean when we say regal vigorous wonderfully vitalized she didn't start at all at the sight of me just looked at me a minute in a perfectly composed sort of way and asked what i wanted at the sound of her voice i heard someone moving behind her in the passage and made out over her shoulder someone whom i took to be a maid or sort of companion loaded down with rugs and cushions my name's geoffrey i said for it was somehow out of the question to try any pretense with a person like that though i didn't know what sort of reception my name would get but her face lighted up at it as if she were genuinely pleased and she held out her hand to me at last she said i was beginning to think you were a myth she nodded toward a couple of big chairs in the pergola and added i was just going out for a doze in the warm sun but a chat with you will be much better then she turned back and spoke to the woman in the passage will you please bring an extra rug miss martin this momentary delay gave me my story i wrote to dr crow said i asking for permission to see you and he told me you'd receive me to-day i thought i saw just a flicker of surprise go over her face at that but it didn't show much more than she meant it to and all she said was dr crow is a very competent young man the woman she called miss martin came up just then and began bundling her up in rugs and packing in cushions about her but though she was busily occupied with miss meredith all the time i couldn't help feeling that she was regarding me with a certain uneasiness and mistrust miss meredith insisted on my having one of the rugs and then sent miss martin into the house telling her she shouldn't need her for an hour i thought the woman went away reluctantly well we chatted for a few minutes about the beauty of the day and the pleasure of getting out into the country for the early spring and i admitted that i had got myself pretty well mired up trespassing in her woods she seemed to take that absolutely as a matter of course and didn't show the slightest curiosity about where i had been though i said i had been looking at the river from the boat landing then all at once she reverted to what she had said before about beginning to think that i was a myth drew she had thought all along that my not seeing her had been my own doing she'd wanted to see me she said but crow had made me out a sort of hermit who didn't see anybody if he could help it how he reconciled a statement like that with the fact that i am a portrait painter i don't know she was perfectly frank in her curiosity about me as an autocratic old lady like that is likely to be and kept me talking about myself for a solid hour asked innumerable questions about how i paint where i live about my life abroad and so on at the end of the hour miss martin appeared again miss meredith got up a little reluctantly you'll stay to lunch won't you she said i haven't had as pleasant a morning in a long time i hope you're not in a hurry to get back to new york of course i said i'd stay with the greatest pleasure she gave me an informal nod and started toward the door miss martin will take charge of you till lunch time she said i dare say you will want to freshen up a bit after your tramp through the woods we'll lunch at one and with that she walked into the house i waited a minute for miss martin to follow her and lead the way for me but instead of that she stood right where she was apparently making up her mind to say something it was then i took my first good look at her she was a tall rather lean young woman unmistakably well-bred with a severe profile and a rather tight way of doing her hair she stood there confronting me a little embarrassed but perfectly resolute i had unconsciously moved a little toward the door and she was standing beside one of the pillars she stepped into the doorway and stood confronting me i'm very sorry 
she said to be obliged to countermand miss meredith's invitation countermand it said i i am miss meredith's nurse she said i am under the doctor's explicit instructions i haven't any discretion at all in the matter i must ask you to go away mr jeffrey at once those are dr crow's instructions i asked she didn't answer that question at all just stood there looking at me and said again at once her manner as well as her words made it perfectly clear that i shouldn't get into that door except by brute force the thing was so utterly unexpected and in the light of the deception crow had practised toward me with miss meredith so sinister that i was very loath to accept the situation just at that second as i was preparing to turn away i started again and all but duplicated my yell in the stateroom the night before because something soft and alive dropped from the pillar over my head upon my shoulder i clutched at it and found i had in my hand what do you suppose drew the same fluffy little baby raccoon that had tried to pull my eyelid up the night before the nurse smiled a pleasant sort of smile and rescued the thing from my hand i'm sorry she said that's miss meredith's newest pet he's quite harmless but i'm afraid rather disconcerting that's his second adventure within the last twenty-four hours end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the ghost girl by henry kitchell webster this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen dr crow forgets Geoffrey stopped there and for a while we just sat looking at each other the links connected it seemed to me into a perfect chain of unescapable inferences crow on receiving Geoffrey's note in order to make sure of avoiding even a chance meeting between him and miss meredith had sent her off to beech hill the escapades of the baby raccoon made it plain that the occupants of the stateroom next to Jeffreys were Miss Meredith and her companion. It was from that stateroom that the insane laughter which horrified Jeffrey had issued, and the words, She's dead, I killed her. The nurse's action in countermanding her mistress's invitation to lunch made it evident enough who the maniac was that had made that confession. And then there was the skiff, the unlocked boathouse, the long painter cut where the forward end of it had been tied round a thwart. Oh, it wasn't evidence. Richards would laugh at it, but see how well it fitted in. Then I recalled the gossip about the meredith family that Geoffrey had extracted from the driver who took him out to beech hill the brilliant highly bred wilful merediths with the streak almost of insanity that cropped up here and there of claire's artist father and her peasant mother of the strange life the girl must have led of the girl's disappearance over there in paris and Miss Meredith's return with the announcement that she was dead. How had the streak cropped up in Claire herself? What, if Geoffrey's theory were right, was the cause of the bitter enmity that accounted for her appearance in New York under another name, and of the tragedy that led to the finding of the body in the river and the maniacal confession Geoffrey overheard, through the thin partition between the two staterooms but the whole succession of incidents wove themselves into a pattern that was plain enough to read and grim enough i thought i glanced around at Geoffrey, who stood at the window looking out at the fading electric lighted city twilight and the uncanny almost fear of him that so often came over me came back again how had he managed amid the maze of misleading circumstances to disentangle the true threads of the mystery well said i 
catching at richard's phrase i don't see how you do it but there's no doubt you've done it again geoffrey wheeled around done what he asked solved the mystery of the girl in the eyes geoffrey shook his head soberly that's just what i haven't done said he i never was more puzzled in my life not all the details i'll admit said i but the main facts of it certainly what was richard's phrase you've got a confession and a motive that is if you call a maniacal impulse a motive and you've got a mass of corroborating circumstances so had richard's said geoffrey and yet i haven't got the real answer any more than he had i told you the truth just now when i said i never was more puzzled in my life well i may be stupid said i but it looks pretty complete to me pretty complete echoed geoffrey grimly that's the secret of all richard's mistakes his cases are all pretty complete but drew no case is complete so long as it contains one single circumstance that contradicts the rest it isn't complete until everything fits everything well said i what is there here that doesn't fit do you remember what the insane voice said in the stateroom i killed her with a pin what did she mean by that the girl in the eyes had been shot raving said i you can't expect a maniac to be logical and then he went on who put the boat in the river who unlocked the boathouse and launched the boat and towed the body out into the current insane people are pretty strong sometimes said i miss meredith might have done it oh she's strong enough to do it today," said geoffrey but that wasn't a maniacal act maniacs are cunning too said i it wasn't a cunning act retorted geoffrey an insane person would be too clever once he started out to dispose of the body to make such a bad job of it if the body was to be put into the water why wasn't it weighted so it would sink why wasn't the boat returned to its proper place in the boathouse and the painter cut away the person who disposed of that body was acting under the logical terror of the consequences of his act a thing a maniac isn't hampered by and then there's dr crow how do his actions fit into the story no there's something more there something i haven't even got a glimpse of yet it had grown late it was long after anybody's office hours and the big building where i had my office was strangely still as such buildings are at night in the silence that fell between us we heard the clash of the door to the single occasional elevator that served the whole building during the evening hours heard through the open transom the soft purr of its rise and then the clash of another door as it stopped at our floor to let someone out then there came the hollow ring of footsteps down the corridor and to my surprise a knock at my outer door i don't know who that can be said i the listlessness of a moment before had disappeared from geoffrey's attitude he stood erect and tense his eyes were bright and his lips curved into a hard smile let him in he said softly my office boy had gone long ago springing the catch of the outer door behind him so that it was there that i went to admit my visitor he was the man we had just been talking about oh dr crow said i won't you come in he stepped into the outer office i tried to get you at your house he said and they told me i might find you here i'm sorry to call at such an hour but it's important his face and his manner were grave and rather oppressive the only fault i had found with him on the occasion of our other interview had been his smile which he turned on rather too often and suddenly there was no trace of that smile now i had a note yesterday from mr geoffrey 
he went on stating that he had sent us the portrait of miss claire meredith and asking for an appointment with miss meredith herself i made that appointment and waited in all the afternoon but mr jeffrey didn't keep it his note was urgent and i hoped that possibly you might give me some information about him my impression is said i that mr jeffrey did keep his appointment but he's here in my office at this moment won't you come in and talk with him his face was perfectly expressionless for a full five seconds he didn't move in the direction of the inner door i indicated but at the end of that time he said in a rather level voice i'm glad he's here i'd like to talk with him very much jeffrey turned away from the window as we came into the room his manner to a casual stranger would have seemed languid almost indifferent but my close knowledge of him gave me one or two signs that betrayed the real truth the slightly narrowed almost rigid eyelids and the hardly perceptible quiver of his sensitive nostrils dr crow was under the impression said i when they had greeted each other that you hadn't kept your appointment with miss meredith to-day i told him i thought you had oh yes said jeffrey in a matter-of-fact tone i went up on the night boat to be there bright and early i had a very pleasant visit with her this morning it was for miss meredith's town house that i made the appointment said crow it never occurred to me that you would go to beech hill i don't think either of us mentioned her town house in our exchange of notes said jeffrey i went to beech hill as a matter of course but i take it from your explanation that you didn't intend me to see miss meredith after all crow shook his head the misapprehension has rather forced my hand he said with a sort of rueful frankness i am obliged to confess that i didn't intend you to see her miss meredith had been in town but the state of her health forced me to send her to beech hill i intended to keep the appointment you had made for her and explain matters to you perhaps said jeffrey silkily you will explain them now but i'll say in the meantime for your reassurance that i had the pleasantest sort of visit with miss meredith and my impression is that she enjoyed it as much as i did i can't believe that her having seen me will have any deleterious results we were all seated by that time and jeffrey passed around his cigarettes there was a rather long silence before crow began to talk but even before he had said a word his manner made on me at least a strong impression in his favour there was no pretence about him he seemed like a man approaching a difficult subject with the serious candid intention of getting to the bottom of it the ethics of a doctor's profession he began at last are often very puzzling we are under oath to do certain things and to refrain from doing certain other things and the fact that that oath has been binding for a good many centuries is proof enough of its validity and yet i am going to break it now in one of its important particulars i am forbidden to talk about a patient i am sworn to treat a patient's confidential communications voluntary or otherwise as sacred i cannot be compelled to testify in a court of law any more than a priest can be compelled to violate the secrets of the confessional and yet this case is so exceptional that i really feel compelled to do it i am sure he went on after another moment of silence that i needn't say anything more than this to ensure your treating what i have to tell you as sacredly confidential certainly said i jeffrey nodded i want to begin by saying that as a small boy on my occasional visits to beech hill i was always rather a favourite of miss meredith's she liked me much better than her brother did for no better reason i believe he smiled in a sober sort of way than because i was a harum-scarum sort of youngster a sort of black lamb if you like she quarrelled with my parents however as she did with pretty much nearly everybody in those days and i was genuinely surprised three years ago 
when she returned from paris after claire's death that she should have sent for me to come to make her a visit at beech hill we spent a weekend together there being no other visitor and on my preparing to go back to town she proposed that i give up my practice such as it was and come and live with her she said frankly that she had in mind making me her heir she had tried me out and she believed we should get on together she wanted someone she said to stand between her and the world and she'd rather have me than a paid secretary she offered me a good deal more independence than that sort of position usually carries a whole wing of the house to myself and all the time i wanted for my laboratory work i think i have told you both that she was at that time far from well and that she needed someone with a medical training to look after her that statement was true but it was very far within the truth the fact was that she was not only nervously upset suffering from the shock of claire's death but that her mind was permanently or temporarily i couldn't tell which deranged i think you will see the difficulty of my position the greater part of the time she was as sane as you or i one course that was open to me was to take her before a commissioner in lunacy have her declared insane and have a conservator appointed for her estate such a course would certainly have cleared my skirts of any charge of self-interest or unprofessional conduct and it would benefit a number of distant collateral heirs all of whom hated her none of whom would live with her all of whom were merely waiting for her death to get what they regarded as their share of her property on the other hand the ordeal of facing the commission and of being adjudged insane to a person who was sane enough nine-tenths of the time to fully appreciate the horror of it would undoubtedly be worse for her would tend to perpetuate the insanity which i hoped to cure the course i decided upon was i frankly admit in accordance with my own selfish interests but i believed honestly and sincerely that it accorded with her best interests too i have no difficulty believing that said i and i do really appreciate the difficulties of your situation he laughed grimly not yet you don't he said i thought they were difficult enough at the beginning but that was nothing to what happened within the first week of my attendance upon her he paused there and drew a long rather unsteady breath i'll try not to harrow you with details he said but what happened was that miss meredith had a violent maniacal outbreak during which she said positively that she had killed her niece i didn't dare look at geoffrey i felt rather than saw the sudden relaxation of his body in the chair that told me who knew him so well the intensity with which his mind had been waiting for crow's next words i tried as best i could to get details but all i could get beyond the bare assertion i killed her i know she is dead i killed her myself was the apparent senseless statement i killed her with a pin i confess i didn't know what to do i had never gone back to her own unsupported statement that claire had died of smallpox and i was still inclined to think it likely that that was true but of course i couldn't let it go at that i communicated with friends in paris and asked them to get the official version of claire meredith's death when miss meredith herself had recovered from the attack and was superficially sane again i made an effort to bring up the subject and get some details from her but it was evident that that wouldn't do for some reason or other claire's death was so intimately associated with the source of her delusions that any approach to the subject seemed to bring them back but after what seemed an interminable while i got word from paris the girl had died during a serious epidemic of the disease having been taken as soon as it was diagnosed in her case out of miss meredith's care altogether and conveyed to the pest house there wasn't the faintest irregularity about it nor so far as i could see any opportunity for any irregularity my friends had a copy of the death certificate made and sent it to me 
that was a great relief of course but it left me still in the dark as to what i was most anxious to get at namely the source of miss meredith's delusion she rarely mentioned claire though from occasional remarks she dropped i gathered that they had not got on well together and that the antipathy between them had grown with the years miss meredith's attitude toward her loss has always struck me as being one of remorse rather than of regret as if in her sanest moments she still felt herself responsible for claire's death for some reason or other that was the thing that was preying on her mind and i felt that i must discover the source of the delusion in order to remove it it was by the merest chance in the world that i did discover it i was turning over the contents of her strong-box one day in a search for some papers she had directed me to find when i came upon a photograph of claire a print from the same plate evidently he turned to geoffrey as the one you used for the portrait that picture gave me the clue it was marked spotted all over with pinpricks i heard a little catch in geoffrey's slow even breathing and he sat up with a sudden look of illumination that's very interesting he said it was his first remark since crow had begun his story it must have seemed strange to come upon an evidence of salem witchcraft here in the beginning of the twentieth century you're rather wonderful said crow to get it all in a minute like that it took me three solid days to figure it out and i had heard of one or two other modern cases that might have given me a precedent you will have to explain it to me said i why she must have gone on hating her niece for years in her cold repressed meredith way i know that during the time they lived in paris she was amusing herself with new religions some of the pseudo mysticism that is cropping up everywhere in europe and america and is making life such a cinch for a lot of these fake east indian brahmins the eccentric streak that is so characteristic in her family happened to take that form she had a photograph taken of her niece and began making pinpricks in it with the idea of exercising a malign influence on the girl possibly even with the idea that the effect of it would be fatal the idea was horrifying to me until i came to the conclusion that the act itself had been part of her delusion or perhaps she did it in a wholly experimental and incredulous way without any serious belief that it could do her niece any harm but you will understand in a moment how the coincidence of the malady that did overtake claire must have affected her the marks of smallpox must have seemed perfectly definite correspondence to the pinbricks in the photograph the fact that the doctors called it smallpox even the fact that there was an epidemic of it in the city at the time didn't at all relieve her own interior conviction that she and no one else was responsible for claire's death the moment i discovered where the seat of the delusion was i set to work removing it i brought miss meredith into town took her about with me wherever i thought it was safe in a word did everything i could to divert her mind meanwhile i had sent to the photographer in paris who had made the photograph and asked him for another print when it came back i took it to beech hill and substituted it for the pin-pricked one in miss meredith's box i began talking about claire and finally succeeded in getting miss meredith to talk about her in a more or less normal way finally i said i thought it would be an excellent plan to have claire's portrait painted i remarked that i had come upon an excellent photograph of her in miss meredith's box and that i thought a skilful portrait painter like yourself he nodded toward geoffrey would be able to produce a satisfactory as well as a beautiful portrait from it of course the idea that i had found out which she regarded as her fatal secret excited my patient exceedingly i had taken her to beech hill for the purpose of making the suggestion and against her vigorous protest i went to the box got out the photograph and showed it to her of course she was greatly excited to find it was not defaced but the result of the experiment was as i had anticipated she knew she had been ill had been suffering from delusions 
and she simply placed this among them and dismissed it as nothing worse than a long nightmare she seemed to me to be on the road to a complete recovery and then something happened i couldn't possibly have foreseen something that has gone far to undo all that i tried to accomplish in the way of effecting a cure by some means or other which i never have fathomed a pair of spiritualists learned or guessed that miss meredith might be made their prey they got into communication with her a thing that miss meredith's greatly improved health made it much easier for them to do than it would have been three months before and persuaded her to come to a seance they got hold of some woman i don't know where who bore a rather surprising likeness to miss meredith's dead niece they even succeeded in tricking her out in a gown similar to the one claire had worn when she had her photograph taken and they showed miss meredith a materialization vivid and lifelike enough to upset the mind that had so recently regained its balance there were circumstances which made it impossible for me to appeal to the police so i did the only thing that seemed left for me to do i found out the woman who had impersonated claire at the seance and bribed her with good round sum to disappear and since then i have made some progress toward effecting a second cure you were lucky to get rid of the impostor as easily as that said geoffrey those people generally stick like leeches they go away with one bribe only to come back for another i've an idea that fate took a hand in that game said dr crow soberly i believe the young woman met with foul play certainly the pictures the papers published of the girl who was found in the ice a few months ago bore a striking resemblance to her i'd have been glad to give the police a hint that would lead towards her identification if the circumstances had not made it impossible but i think you will see that my hands were tied in that matter pretty completely yes said geoffrey i can see that crow rose from his chair i hope you can see too he said the reason why my dealings with you have not been as frank and direct as i could wish them to be i honestly meant when i made that appointment with you for this afternoon to tell you something of these circumstances though not so much as i have told you this evening on the whole i am not sorry that you forced my hand i have had to make a great many difficult decisions within the last three years without consulting anybody and i have had to carry around more secrets inside of my head than any man could find pleasant it has been a great relief to take you into my confidence geoffrey rose too well he said if anything more turns up come to us again if there is anything we can do call on us my friend drew here has more common sense than any man i know and i myself come across with a lucky guess occasionally it has been a very interesting story and we are both greatly indebted to you for telling it to us we have a problem of our own on hand which it may help us to solve crow nodded and said good night to geoffrey i was already in the doorway in the act of showing him out by the way said geoffrey and crow stopped short perhaps he had said it a little too casually for i myself had the feeling something was coming there's that photograph you gave me to paint from i must return that i'd forgotten it shall i send it to beech hill or to miss meredith's town address why you may as well send it direct to beech hill said crow i'll attend to it at once said geoffrey and then i shan't have anything more on my mind there is nothing else is there i think not said crow and you can congratulate yourself on a very successful outcome the portrait was really wonderful good night again he looked as he stood there facing geoffrey holding out his hand to him like a man who had just got rid of some long crushing oppression who had just dropped a load off his shoulders and was standing up straight and drawing deep comfortable breaths for the first time in a long while i didn't wonder at that i could see that his secret knowledge of miss meredith's condition his uncertainty the puzzling coincidence of his own selfish interests with those of his patient must have driven him nearly distracted 
so it was with real cordiality when he had followed me to the outer door which i held open for him that i extended my hand to him he didn't seem to see my hand didn't move his own to meet it and at that i looked into his face it had changed somehow in the last five seconds there was a look almost of panic in his eyes he made an imperceptible move as if to brush by me and go back into the inner office but he checked it then with what seemed a supreme effort he recovered his former manner shook hands hastily and walked swiftly away down the corridor to the elevator i found geoffrey pacing up and down his eyes shining with excitement we've got the right trail at last drew he said excitedly we've got it at last he took another turn across the room tugging with both hands at his hair as he was wont to do in moments of excitement then he stopped and stood facing me are you game drew will you see it through with me see what through said i it's all explained now isn't it what is there for us to do we've got to outguess him said geoffrey thoughtfully will he bring her back to town or will he leave her at beech hill he meant to bring her back to town but will he do it now perhaps he's brought her already sent for her as soon as they wired him i'd been there what in the world are you talking about i demanded he paid no attention to my question but started walking up and down again he'll see it said geoffrey he's sure to see it he may catch on any minute i remembered the sudden change that had come over crow's face just before he left me i don't in the least know what you mean said i but geoffrey i believe he has seen it he wheeled and faced me his eyes eager with the question he did not need to ask just before he left me there in the outer office his face changed and a queer look came into it i thought for a moment he was coming back into this room it was as if he'd forgotten something something important and then he changed his mind and went away he sees then said geoffrey well i'm not sorry on the whole i'd rather play the hand that way but what do you mean i cried he had forgotten something said geoffrey soberly oh there's no time to talk now we've got to move quick we've got to go to beech hill to-night we're going to commit a burglary drew are you game End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of the ghost girl by henry kitchell webster this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen a night ride all he waited for was my somewhat dubious nod of assent already he was in my desk chair and by unhooking the telephone receiver he cut short the flood of questions i'd have overwhelmed him with if he'd given me the chance there's a taxi stand on the corner isn't there that'll be quicker than phoning for one do you mind getting it i answered by catching up my coat and hat while you're at the phone though said i do you mind calling my house and telling jack or gwendolen that i shan't be home to-night luckily madeline's away that's a good notion drew he spoke as though it were a particularly shrewd idea and not in the least satirically either evidently it had suggested something to him so instantaneously that he thought the suggestion itself had come from me he often did that i wondered what the idea was but he waved me away so i rushed out after the taxi and left him to arrange matters his own way when i came back with the cab i found him waiting at the curb that surprised me because i had got the idea that secrecy was to be part of the programme if any one were on the watch it would be easy enough to see us starting off together at any rate just as geoffrey took a seat beside me another taxi came up behind 
rather slowly as if waiting to see what we wanted of the road before it tried to pass Geoffrey glanced back at it and then called an address to our own chauffeur the address was that of my own house uptown in a moment i thought i had the idea the taxi behind meant to follow us and Geoffrey had called out that address to throw them off the trail our chauffeur with a warning gesture to the car behind pulled out into the road and turned around the other taxi checking up at the curb to give us room the occupant of it was an insignificant looking young man who gave you the impression of flashiness and shabbiness all at the same time he didn't look at us at all seeming to be looking along for a street number his taxi was still jogging along close to the curb when we turned the corner we needn't have taken so much trouble to mislead him after all said i i thought for an instant he was a detective and so evidently did you what address do you want to go to that's the right address for your house isn't it what are we going to my house for i demanded why said Geoffrey, i thought that was your own idea but it doesn't matter which of us thought of it he went on as i started to protest it's the right place for us to go at that the light went out of his eyes and he leaned back limply against the cushions so completely absorbed in the train of thought that was occupying him that i hadn't the heart for any more questions the taxi was chugging along not so very fast and i with the need for haste that Geoffrey had impressed upon me strongly in mind reached for the speaking tube and was about to tell the chauffeur to speed up a little when Geoffrey took it away from me and shook his head no hurry he said he's going fast enough so by the time we had pulled up at my own door i was pretty completely mystified there was another car standing there and when we got near enough i recognized it as jack's big limousine evidently he and gwendolen were going out somewhere for the door opened just as our car stopped and they came down the steps shall we want the taxi again Geoffrey? i asked no he said we're through with him so i turned to pay the driver Geoffrey lunged out of the cab and at sight of him gwendolen and jack both exclaimed their pleasure at the meeting i got my change from the driver of the taxi and then just as i was turning away to join the group i saw another taxi round the corner it might have been fancy but i thought i recognized it for the same car that had come up behind us just as we were leaving my office we had been followed then after all the car was jogging along in no great hurry than we seemed to be in ourselves what are you people going to do with yourselves asked gwendolen as we came up why i don't know said Geoffrey. we've nothing in particular to do why then come along and dine with us said jack we're going down to dine at one of the restaurants you people are dressed said Geoffrey, and we aren't oh said gwendolen what does that matter we'll go where you won't mind the lafayette or somewhere all the while the other taxi had been drawing closer just as it came opposite us Geoffrey said we'll have to run away afterwards we've an engagement for the end of the evening let's waste no time beginning it then said jack and he caught Geoffrey by the arm and began pushing him toward the car all right said Geoffrey. i followed without a word the other taxi had gone by still rather slowly our car started off with a jump the minute the door was shut behind me evidently the chauffeur had been told what to do at the corner we turned to the right which was natural enough 
if one wanted to follow the avenue downtown but at the first corner we whipped around to the right again and in a minute were flying along on the high speed northward we timed that pretty well i think said gwendolen i never dressed so fast in my life and i'm sure the hooks up my back are just caught into anything but it certainly went as smoothly as if it had been rehearsed i was so afraid i wouldn't be able to say la fayette at the right time but he did hear i'm sure she turned and peered out of the little back window and he isn't following oh it worked said geoffrey like a charm even when we don't turn up at the lafayette he won't know that we haven't changed our minds and gone to some other restaurant an awfully clever idea said gwendolen drew thought of it said geoffrey all i thought of said i was to ask geoffrey to telephone you that i shouldn't be home to-night whenever i've tried to ask him any questions since about what all these manoeuvres meant he's told me it was my own idea but i've only just got it through my head what it's all about did geoffrey also tell you i concluded where we were going and what we are trying to do and did he tell you that this was my idea too he only told us said gwendolen that you were going to burgle beech hill i don't believe any professional ever spoke of cracking a crib more casually than gwendolen did i think i've got everything you need in here she said everything you spoke of and i have put in an extra suit of clothes of cliff's and one of jack's for you it ought to fit pretty well i think and then if anything happens if your looks get damaged or anything the fresh clothes will be much more respectable bully for you geoffrey said you know you people are a pair of trumps to turn in and help us out this way we're making criminals of you too accessories before the fact that's the term isn't it drew we're going to be ever so much more accessory than you think said gwendolen we're going all the way to oldborough oh jack says it's all right she went on in answer to my movement of protest what's the sense of our getting off at the ferry and going back when we can just as well go all the way and see the fun i doubt if it turns out to be precisely a picnic said geoffrey seriously i don't see exactly how we're going to work the trick ourselves and as for taking a gallery along to cheer gallery indeed said gwendolen indignantly i don't believe you have figured it out what are you going to do with the car while you're burgling you can't go chugging right up to the driveway in it if you leave it beside the road somewhere it will attract as much attention as an elephant if you send it to the garage at oldborough just with james that'll look queer and if you appear yourselves and don't go to the hotel then you'll have to be accounted for if you send the car home without you then you'll have to take a train or the day boat and that may turn out to be awkward too you've got the difficulties down cold said geoffrey but i'm hoping that the spur of the moment will supply us with something wait till you've heard my plan said gwendolen then perhaps you'll apologize for the word gallery you can't help four people being more conspicuous than two said geoffrey with a shake of the head it needs people to account for the car gwendolen retorted jack and i can do that to-night and to-morrow morning we look pretty respectable when we turn up at the old borough hotel with a punctured tire no matter what time of night it is no one will think that there's anything queer about it and you won't have to appear at all you're right said geoffrey quickly i withdraw the word gallery and apologize in the morning of course you'll start out for town and pick us up at some lonely bend of the road perhaps said gwendolen but we thought we'd take two rooms 
on the ground floor because i'll be nervous about fire we'll only use one of them and leave the other so that if you happen to need a place to hide in or change your clothes again you'll have it we'll leave the window open a little and something oh a towel hanging out over the sill so you'll know you may not want it but it may come in handy geoffrey laughed richard says you ought to be a member of the force he observed but upon my word i believe your real talent is for crime it's pretty much the same she said rather soberly you've got to be able to think crimes either to commit them or to detect them i'd argue that point with you said geoffrey if duty didn't call me out in front that chauffeur of yours knows the town like the palm of his hand but it's a dark night and once we get out on the country roads a cat-eyed person like me who can see in the dark will be helpful we didn't protest very strongly against his going because we had seen from his air of preoccupation that he wanted the solitude of his own thoughts rather than our talk he opened the door slipped out on the running board and clambered to the seat beside the chauffeur his going turned loose a flood of questions and surmises what puzzled jack and me the most was the object of this night journey what purpose had geoffrey in mind that could justify this rush in the dark the risk of detection and capture in the very act of committing a crime for housebreaking was a crime even if one didn't mean to make away with the family jewels or plate whatever his object is said jack why doesn't he tell us i doubt if he could tell us any better than he has said gwendolen he's found out enough evidently to make it clear to him that the crime was committed in that house and his instinct tells him if he can get into the house and look at the actual scene he will see something that will explain the crime itself then she set me to work recounting the events of the afternoon richard's call geoffrey's arrival with the narrative of his adventures on his former visit to beech hill and finally the coming of dr crow i told the story as nearly as i could in his own words and as i told it the conviction his narrative had carried with it came back to me i declare i concluded i don't see what more there is to explain geoffrey was saying just before crow came in that no case was complete as long as it contained a single contradictory circumstance but i am blessed if i see any contradiction in that because crow's story fits in absolutely with richard's present theory of the case with mrs barton's confession and what geoffrey himself heard in his stateroom on the night boat what was it that mr geoffrey said when dr crow got through with his story asked gwendolen something perfectly trivial said i about returning the photograph they'd given him to paint from dr crow said he could mail it to be chill and then asked gwendolen that was all said i geoffrey said he wanted to get it all off his mind and there wasn't anything else was there crow said no and that geoffrey could congratulate himself on a highly successful outcome there was a moment of silence then gwendolen caught her breath oh she said there was another minute of silence and then she asked didn't dr crow see he'd made a slip didn't he try to come back and say anything more you and geoffrey will be the death of me i exclaimed yes he did that is he started to say something and checked himself but how did you know he'd done that how did geoffrey know what was the slip he'd forgotten the gown said gwendolen 
don't you see they loaned mr jeffrey clare's own gown to pose a model in it was ever so much more valuable than the photograph and an infinitely more intimate souvenir of the girl herself he couldn't have forgotten it unless unless what i asked for she had hesitated there when she went on her voice was graver unless cliff he knew what had become of the gown unless he'd seen it so often since that he'd almost forgotten mr jeffrey had it he couldn't have forgotten it not when mr jeffrey had spoken of the photograph and asked him straight out if there weren't anything else unless he had known what had become of the gown i sat for five solid minutes trying to fit that stubborn circumstance into crow's story he didn't know the gown had been stolen he couldn't have known not if he knew no more of irene fournier than that he'd bribed her to disappear and give his patient a second chance for recovery there's something else said gwendolen thoughtfully something else that doesn't fit there are the earrings cliff he had them in his card case he dropped one of them on the rug in the studio and came back and tried to get it those were claire's earrings how did dr crow get them that seems natural enough said i miss meredith brought them home with her very likely they were in the same box with the defaced photograph then you'll have to believe it was a ghost that mr jeffrey saw on the bridge i don't know said i that girl might have been irene but the earrings she cried that's where mr jeffrey saw them that girl was wearing them well i saw it at last not the way jeffrey did i couldn't hope for that it was even probable that gwendolen herself getting the story at second hand from me saw more than i did but i saw enough to explain our night's journey through the velvet dark enough to give that silent house of beech hill that i had never seen a strange eerie attraction i felt somehow that in that house to-night the mystery would be solved suddenly through the glass i saw jeffrey turn to the chauffeur with a quick order the car checked its speed we were on a brick paved main street of a small town and the pasty surface didn't accommodate itself well to the sudden checking of our speed the car did a sweeping side slip down against the curb and stopped on the intersection of cross street half a block down i could see the lights of a lunch wagon jeffrey reached back and opened the door aren't you people getting hungry in there he said i am none of us had thought of it before but the realization of it came to us all at once i'll go down to that lunch wagon i volunteered and get a dozen red hots then we can eat them as we ride that's a good notion said jeffrey approvingly i slipped from the car and made my way up the dimly lighted cross street halfway to my destination i passed a man and a woman coming from the direction in which i was bound i had my hat low down over my eyes as they passed me then i heard him say to her they'll do until we can get a more civilized meal and i remembered having observed that he had a paper bag in his hand something about the urbane quality of his voice made me turn and look after them their appearance as they blurred into the darkness of that dimly lighted street confirmed the impression that his voice had made that they weren't any more than we inhabitants of this village he had on a long ulster and a motoring cap and she seemed to be heavily veiled my principal feeling though was one of irritation 
i had dr crow so strongly in my thoughts that the very last glimpse i got of that disappearing back reminded me of him i went on to the lunch wagon made my purchase and had got almost back to the car when i heard the sudden roar of a motor it wasn't our own car that was chugging away passively on just enough gas to keep it turning over but looking ahead down the road i saw the diminishing red tail-light of another car geoffrey was slouched down in his seat his cap over his eyes his head sunk forward on his chest he paid no attention to my arrival indeed it seemed as if he had fallen asleep he aroused with a start when i touched him here you are said i even then he looked at me blankly for a second then rose rather stiffly and climbed back into the interior of the car with the rest of us we may as well eat standing still said he it's lots pleasanter then i saw that gwendolen was eyeing him curiously End of chapter 15